Welcome, my friends, to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm Casey Gomez, and I'm thrilled you're joining me today for a fun conversation with a passionate author. We're kicking off the program like it's our tradition with a short reading from the future book. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Hi there, my name is James Rogers, and the name of my novel is Flight of the Eternal Emperor. And I would describe the genre as science fantasy. I would like to read a short piece from the beginning of the novel. She stepped from the elevator, holding her baby girl on her hip as she took her keys from her pocket. Don't run, she called to her son as he took off down the corridor. She shook her head and sighed as she watched him trail his hand along the filthy wall. As she tried to get hold of the apartment key, the bunch slipped from her fingers to clatter on the tiles. Damn. She went on her uncles to retrieve them. The baby wriggled, eyes flickering open. She thought she saw a smile. She smiled back. Standing up, she saw her son had stopped walking down the corridor, his back to the wall, as he watched an older boy approach from the other end. She recognized the teenager, a bully from two floors up. She started towards her son, anger bubbling. Why should he have to live in fear of a brat like this? She stopped when she realized her son appeared confused rather than scared. She looked at the bully. He had stopped in the middle of the corridor with his eyes wide and his mouth slowly stretching open, his hands groping blindly as he staggered, then fell back against the wall. Plaster dust showered from the ceiling. Her heart leaped into a higher gear as she recognized the symptoms. A pitiful croak escaped the boy as, sliding down the wall, he grappled with unseen fingers at his throat. Goosebumps rose along her arms. Quick, she called to her son. Come. They ran back the way they had come, away from the damned. She pressed for the elevator. The motor whirred, then stopped. She pressed the button again. The baby squirmed, cried a little, as if her anxiety were being transmitted to her daughter. Her son pressed up against her. He peered out from behind her leg at the teenager. She tried to ignore the sounds, the gagging, the dull thump of a leg slapping against the floor. Don't look at him. She could hear clunking from the elevator below, but no motor. She grabbed her boy and made for the stairs. The boy was too slow. He could only take one step at a time. She grabbed him under his arms and lifted. Down they went with her almost falling twice. To the corridor below, to her friend's apartment. It was locked. She pounded on the door. Please. The baby cried. The boy's lip trembled. She went to her knees, pulled the boy towards her, and pushed the baby against his chest. Confused, the boy pushed back. Mommy, he cried. Stop it. Move your hands. She squeezed her children together, making them one. What's the matter? An unfamiliar voice spoke. She looked up at a man in the sky blue robes of the Order of Lurg, the God of Light. Is the child sick? Take the boy, she pleaded, pushing her son towards him. Please take him away. The priest frowned. Why? I don't understand. What's the matter? He reiterated. Take him, she yelled. The baby started to choke. No, she screamed. Please, no. In horror, she looked down at the little face. The eyes screwed up. The tiny mouth opened, tongue protruding as the little one struggled for breath. She could actually see the neck tightening. Please, she whimpered, don't, please. A terrible croak emanated from the delicate creature before the head lolled to one side. She cradled her daughter's head in the crook of her neck and stroked her hair, rocking back and forth and crying till her throat cracked. The boy took a step back, whimpering. The priest didn't move. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Inside the Minds of Authors. I am excited you guys to join us for another week. We have a fabulous author with us today. It's going to be an amazing episode. 
If you're new to the podcast, go ahead and subscribe. You don't want to miss a single episode. We're here with new authors and new books on Monday nights. Make sure to follow us along. If you have some time, go ahead, give us a like, review the show. We're always better when we're growing together. And you're here to find out who we had this week. I have questions. Hello, Mr. James. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Welcome and congratulations on the book. I'm excited you're here. Thank you. We're excited. We have questions. What is this book about and where did this story come from? Well, what it's about, I suppose the story itself revolves around Jessica. She's an avionics engineer and then uh, she sort of mysteriously ends up being in included in the crew of the, the first interstellar voyage, a 30 light year journey to a sister planet. And Jessica is suspicious, especially since the crew also includes these enigmatic magicians. And she believes that it is actually all a ruse and that the craft is in fact a weapons platform in orbit with its missiles trained at the troublesome rebels in the north. And she's a secret member of these rebels. What she doesn't understand is that the Eternal Emperor, as then the novel is named after him, The Flight of the Eternal Emperor, is about him trying to get off the planet because it is dropping into an ice age. And he, being immortal, he or his trusted first advisor, more to the point, is thinking long term and wants to have an escape route. She unwittingly gets mixed up in the middle of this and it goes from there. I suppose what the novel is about, I would say, atonement and fear of death and how we often we spend, some of us especially, spend a lot of time worrying about things that we really shouldn't be worrying about. It's a huge theme, very universal, yeah. but also things that whether we like it or not, we spend a lot of time focus on them. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And little things and big things that we worry about. And sometimes they're genuine things to worry about. And sometimes they're things we really shouldn't be worrying about. Part of that I tried to explore in the novel. There is a group called the Grid Riders, and they are immortal beings that are impervious. Nothing can ever harm them. And yet there's a subset known as the Necrophobes, and they are actually terrified of the death of the universe because that's the only thing that can bring about their end so even though these beings have absolutely nothing to fear they fear the death of the universe itself and they have an irrational belief that Destlar the emperor is somehow their messiah and that he's somehow going to save them and um, so I suppose it's also about blind faith and having faith in something even though there's there may be absolutely no evidence for having this faith you have a lot of themes coming together and crashing into each other yes you know <laughs> your opening scenes has been going what, what killed the baby what, what's going on what, what's that's, that's what i'm hoping people oh my god be... <laughs> mission accomplished because i'm like wait what killed the boy what killed the... what's going on and you have us very hooked on the whole concept of death does this just come upon you or is there a reason behind when you decided to come up with this book where did that idea come from i will tell you that when i was in my late teens the early 20s i discovered fantasy actually the uh, raymond e feist i'm not sure how to pronounce the last name f-e-i-s-t i don't know if you've ever heard of him but he wrote a way back in the 80s he wrote a series called the rift war saga which i loved and that's when i discovered fantasy and I got into Tolkien and all that but I was also really really interested in science fiction and at the time my favorites were Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov and people like that and I had ideas but I figured as a student in Ireland in Belfast I was studying electronics engineering and I thought well who am I to write I have no right to be a writer but I had ideas and then I discovered that Arthur C. Clarke had begun his life as an electronics engineer. So I thought, oh, okay, let me try. So I had just read Stephen King's short story, The Jaunt, and I had read The Rift War Saga, and the two together gave me this idea for this story. Now, that's a long time ago. That's 30 years ago. That was my first effort to write, so naturally it was awful. And I left it aside for many years, and I started writing short stories. 
And I really enjoy writing short stories and in all different genres. And I've had about 16, 17 stories published now. So I really enjoy that side. But then I went back to the novel, I would say maybe about 10 years ago, and rewrote the entire thing from scratch. But the basic idea was still the same and just wrote it from scratch and then started pushing it to try and get it published, which, of course, takes a lot of time and effort, too. So that's where we are now. I have two more novels that neither is complete, but and I work on them every now and again while I still write short stories. I love the fact that you went back to the novel. 30 years in the making, time does not matter. Yeah. You still committed. You were still publishing short stories. You're still in the craft. But yeah. you decided to, you know what, I'm going to give this a chance. What made you push it? Because sometimes as authors, we're like, you know what, I'm just not even going to go there. What made you decide, I'm taking the leap? I still just loved the idea, the central idea of the story, which, as I say, a big part of if you um, read the novel and you read Stephen King's short story, The Jaunt, which is a wonderful short story, you would see where... You can see where my I was inspired by that short story. And so I had that idea and it never went away. It kept niggling at me. And I thought, right, I'm going to go back and try and write it properly this time, with having known a bit about how to write at that point. And then trying to get it published was I had been writing short stories on and off. I, I had been writing whenever I felt like it, basically. And two things really changed that. One of them was when I read an interview, uh, I think Neil Gaiman wrote something about Terry Pratchett and about how Pratchett was so prolific as a writer that even before he became a full-time author and he had a day job, he would write at least 100 words a night. He just had that rule. I thought, oh, well, okay, I'm only writing when I feel like it. And the thing is that once I would sit down and write, I would love it. But sometimes I would have to force myself to get it. But once I start, I'm flying. But I decided then, well, okay, I'm going to do something similar. So Monday to Friday, I either write or submit a story. I take the weekend off to watch sport because I love sport. But I will write or, or at least do something about my writing Monday to Friday. And then the second thing that happened was talking to the, the writer, Colin McCann, and having a discussion with him led me to realize that writing wasn't enough, that I needed to submit. And it's the horrible part of writing, finding, trying to find in that magazine that you think your story might fit and writing the cover letter and making sure you stick to the how that particular magazine wants the story submitted and knowing I had to joke with my wife when I'm hitting the submit, I say, here comes another rejection. Because knowing that the vast majority of the times will be a rejection. But if you keep just sending them out, sending them out, sending them out, eventually somebody takes them. So those were the two things. Determining to do something about the writing each day, except the weekend, and making sure to submit. So I'm glad that you stayed persistent with it and didn't give up and continue to create the craft. I find the publishing is the business side that I'm like, oh, yeah, it's a little tough. painful, but it has to do <laughs> yeah. it. So yes, yeah. I absolutely love it. As you continue to definitely start this process of novel writing, what is one thing you found different between writing a novel and a short story? Oh my God, they're hugely different. Well, I do say that writing the first draft of a novel is great fun. And was it Hemingway that said that the first draft of everything is rubbish? Something I'm paraphrasing was something like that, that. And the first draft is always terrible. So the first draft of a novel is great fun because you can just fly through and just whatever, keep writing it, keep writing it, keep writing it, whatever comes out. It's when you go back and start writing the, the subsequent drafts that you really have to start figuring out what you're doing. So it takes an awful lot more planning. A short story, my way of writing short stories, very often I have no idea what the story's about when I begin. And that's great fun. One story I remember, it's a short story about a little boy. And I was well into writing the story before I realized that the boy was a ghost. So I didn't know it until. And I remember I would hear 
authors talk about before I started writing, I would hear authors talking about not, oh, they didn't know that the character was going to do such and such. And I used to think, what nonsense should you create the character? And, but it is absolutely true. Sometimes you just don't see what's coming. And uh, that is the great fun of it. So very often I'll start where it might be a phrase I heard or it might be something I saw on the street or something that would say, oh, there's an idea for a story. Like, for example, there's several stories I have that I'm in the middle of writing. But there was one where um, I was on the subway in New York and they have the automatic announcement that says, you know, something like the, the elevator is situated at the center of the platform. And I misheard it and thought it said the alligator is situated at the center of the platform. And of course, immediately my brain ticked and said, oh, no, elevator, not alligator. But I thought, wouldn't it be fun to write a story where there's some guy that when he mishears something, it happens. So some kind of weird supernatural thing that if he, he mishears something, it happens. So he mishears that. And then there's headlines in the papers about people being attacked by an alligator in the New York City subway. So I don't know where that story is going. I've started it. I have an idea that maybe he tries to do something that he just can't hear anything because when he's afraid of mishearing stuff. I have it where he doesn't listen to music with lyrics anymore because he mishears lyrics. But I don't have a clue where that's going. But it's great fun writing it. I don't know how other people who write short stories, how they go about it. But that's my crazy method. I and love it. You are an absolute pantser. You should go where the inspiration comes. I'm a plotter. I need outlines or else nothing happens. Like my story right. should stop. And then I'm just looking at each other. So I love it. Love the way that you allow the stories to evolve and develop and kind of yeah. take their own spin, which is fabulous. Because sometimes I think as writers, we want to control everything and everything does not want to come that way. So I'm loving yeah. the paths you're taking. Yeah, it is. It is fun. And but sometimes I do have like I had an idea for it's a crime story. First, the only time I ever wrote a crime story was called In the Loop, where that was one where I had the idea. It was from watching a TV show, Tales of the Unexpected, actually. There were originally stories by Roald Dahl. And then there were other authors where they turned their stories into short episodes. It was one of those that inspired an idea. But that's the only time I can think of where I had the plot for the short story right through. Otherwise, I just wing it and see what happens. It works really well for you. So tell me, dear, what advice would you give an up-and-coming author who is interested in starting writing and is going, you know, it's been too long. How do I do this? What will you tell them? Well, just first, just start writing. But also, it is true what everybody says that to write, you must read. You don't notice it, but you do pick up so many things from when you're reading other great authors, you're picking up how it is that you should write a story. And even little things like if you think about, I don't know why this morning I was thinking about the original Jurassic Park movie and how at the start they haven't shown like what, explaining how velociraptors hunt so that later on in the movie, we kind of know what's coming when the velociraptors start hunting and that kind of thing, That that's all part of the craft of learning how to set the stage and how to drag the readers in. So reading other people is hugely important. So plenty of reading and then just start writing. I know it's a simple thing to say, but just start. And the more you write, the better you get at it. But I also say you have to submit. You have to submit because you got to get the stuff out there. The writing for itself is really, really enjoyable, of course. But there's nothing like knowing that people are reading your work. It's a great feeling. Also, I have know somebody who got very disillusioned because of getting rejections, but you got to just take them that. If you send to a magazine, they might get over a thousand, several, maybe several thousand submissions, and they can only include maybe five or six stories. So naturally, they're going to be rejecting great stories. So to not take rejections personally, so don't let rejection make you feel like there's something wrong with your writing. Just keep sending. That's my I advice. Was, I was going to ask you how you handle rejection because you made a comment earlier about, you know, oh, here's another rejection. But you <laughs> yeah. said it so comfortable. You're like, ah. Yeah, because <laughs> because I understand what it is. One of my proudest moments, I suppose, there's a, a magazine called Inscape and it's 
been published yearly, just yearly, since 1972. And the, according to an, an external, nothing to do with their website, there's a website called Duotrope, by the way. I don't know if you know it, that's what I okay. use. It's a wonderful search engine for authors. I digress for a moment, but it is a fantastic uh, search it engine. It's called Duotrope, D-U-O, Duotrope, I think, T-R-O-P-E, I think. It's a search engine specifically for authors that it'll find magazines, agents, publishers. So you can put into the, you know, what type of story you have, the length of the story, and it'll bring up a list of magazines that are looking for that kind of story. And you can start checking out the different ones to see which one might be the best and then more suitable, and then you send it off. So according to that website, that Inscape, re they reject 96% of the stories sent to them. And I got a story in there, one of my stories, uh, that I was over the moon with that one. But it did make you think that there are, that's what's happening with an awful lot of the magazines. They're rejecting the vast majority of what's sent to them. It doesn't mean that, it's, that there's anything wrong with the story that's rejected it just might be they just don't have enough space for all the stories they might be that your story just doesn't particularly suit their magazine so just getting a rejection doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the writing itself sometimes you just get the form rejections most of the time I have to say, you get the form rejections because they just don't have time to to provide feedback but sometimes you get the nice ones that say that's a really good story. It just doesn't fit our magazine. Keep sending it, something like that, which is really encouraging as well. If you stopped submitting just because you got rejections, sure you'd get nowhere. And every author has gone through that. I know of an author who used to have, back in the days when you get paper, actually physical rejections, he had his bathroom papered with all his <laughs> rejection letters stand in his bathroom and read all the different <laughs> rejections he got. So, like a commitment. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. I love the advice you give it, and I love the fact that you're still submitting and you're encouraging authors to do the same. Because yes, sometimes definitely. I think we get lost in our heads and we're like, oh, nobody likes this, and then we don't do anything else. So I love yeah. it. So tell me here, where can our listeners find you? Where they can learn more about your books and anything else? Tell us. Well, my website is jameswrogers.com. So it's J-A-M-E-S-W and it's R-O-G-E-R-S. There's no D in the Rogers. Some people spell it with a D. So that jameswrogers.com on there is uh, the list of all the short stories I've had published and the novel as well. Some of the short stories are published in free to read online magazines and some of them are in actual physical magazines that have to be bought. So if anyone wanted to just try some of my short stories before they, they wanted to commit fully, then some of those stories are available for free on the web. And as I say, then the links to uh, where you can buy the book, the novel, it's in any of the, the usual Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all those different back in, in the other side of the Atlantic and Waterstones, all those different and then any bookshop, if you went into it, they, they will order it for you if they don't have it on the shelf. That is awesome. To our listeners, check it out. Check out the website. Make sure you take a look at it. And you can check out any of the articles in case you're curious. I'm like, hmm, how does really this is all about? So I love it. Okay, Mr. James, before you leave us, are you ready for the lightning round? Okay. Easy peasy. Don't think too hard on this. Let's go. Cold drinks or hot? Oh, cold. Superhero or villain? Mm, I prefer villains. <laughs> Me too. Hotel or camping? Oh, definitely hotel. You're my kind of guy. <laughs> Driving or flying? Oh, flying. Me Here's too. a little more nice, usually. Thank you. I'm totally with you. Here's a little different. Let's see how you do with this one. What is the one book that has touched you the most? Oh, gosh, that one is, I don't know. That is a tough one. Touch me. I don't know. I really don't. There's been just too many. Isn't that usually the hard part? Yeah, I couldn't pick out a single one that, and I love all different genres too, and nonfiction. So, oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> is it all right to say I, I don't know? 
Yes, you have plenty. That's not a bad thing. The fact that you have that many works for us. Mr. James, it has been such a pleasure. Do you have any closing remarks for us? No, just to thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk about my writing. It's a passion. I love it. I still have a day job, of course. So I'm not that successful, but I absolutely love it. And if anybody after this ends up buying my novel and enjoying it, well, then nothing would make me happier. So thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. love having you here. Congratulations again on the book. To our listeners, make sure you go ahead and check out Mr. James. Check out the website. Grab the book. You are going to enjoy it. And remember, we'll be back next Monday with another fabulous author. So don't forget to subscribe and join us. Everyone, have an amazing day. Bye, Mr. James. Thank you. Bye-bye.